welcome to episode 75 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 28th of October 2019. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelan. Good evening. Graham. Hello. And Will. Hello. Yes, hello everyone. As you may tell, I am slightly under the weather, but I'm going to soldier on. I managed to get out of work yesterday, thanks to Drew. Thank you, Drew. But uh, I'm going to soldier on with this. So let's start with a bit of news then. The BBC has joined the dark web, as they put it. They have now put their news content, their international news content, on tour. So even if your country blocks it, you can access it, which is pretty cool, but I'm not sure about them referring to it as the dark web. Yeah, you're right about the dark web reference, but I guess the fact that the BBC is doing this at all, I think it's a really good thing. I mean, just tonight um, when I saw this news story, I fired up my tour browser, so this is not doing it properly, but um, loaded up. You know, waited the three minutes required to load up the BBC's website. <laughs> Did you get the uh, the capture? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see that CBeebies is still an option there on tour. <laughs> but there's no iPlayer and stuff. It's like only the um, the stuff that you would otherwise be able to get from outside the UK. Yeah, but it, it is cool, definitely. But I just why don't, don't call it the dark web? That just you know makes it seem shady when it's not. Yeah. Although, when you said that you've got the, the Tor browser installed, I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, what for? <laughs> what you've been doing, eh? It's going to be interesting to see what you know the kind of difference in news stories presented to the to the Onion network um, and the regular network. See if there's, I mean, the selection there seems regular at the moment. People can't accept that I'm happy being fat, and Little Britain's set to return for a Brexit special. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Little Britain could never get made today with all the, like, blacking up and everything, so good luck with that, chaps. Um, all right, so Start Page, which is your favorite search engine, Fanim, has been bought by an ad company. Was, was, past tense. <laughs> oh. I, I've upped sticks and I'm on the move looking for new pastures. Oh, you should use DuckDuckGo. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't that be fuck, fuck off? <laughs> <laughs> what is that stupid thing mean anyway? Duck, duck, go. Like, what the fuck? Who's torturing ducks to tell them to go places? I just... Anyway. No, it's an American game, isn't it? I think we call it something different in Europe. I can't remember what it is now. Okay, I'll take your word for it. But yeah, so just to be clear, dear listener, who's about to suggest duck, duck, go, and why it's amazing, just because they say that it's all private and everything doesn't mean shit because they're American. They only say what the man in dark glasses tell them to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're looking for a search engine then? Well, I mean, there is, uh, there's a Reddit post by one of the, I don't know whether they were a director or owner or what it was, um, Liz McIntyre, um, and she left and posted a series of questions that they should ask the new owners because the new owners have said they will keep it privacy uh, related but it is an ad company so i really find that hard to believe um but there is actually a non-official ask me anything it wasn't as in somebody asked a bunch of questions and they did respond to them um about how they're separate business units and stuff like that and all data that goes to any US servers that they might have is um, de-anonymized first. Uh, any US staff that they have don't get to view that same data. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know. And that, I, to be honest, I, I don't know whether I can take their word for it, to be honest. So yeah, I am looking for others. Because their business model up until now has been ads but those ads were directly related to what you had searched for not any history or anything yeah exactly like imagine that if you're interested in searching for something you might want an ad for it because that might be relevant to you yeah you search for ups's and you get hey hey check out this reasonably priced ups or whatever yeah I mean, I don't think anybody would have too much of a problem with that. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's not adver it's not advertising to you for the thing you searched for once three weeks ago and then repeatedly telling you you could buy it now like fucking Amazon does. Like, mm. I I've never seen a website show me all the things I've just bought and advertise them to me weeks later. Like, So I suppose it remains to be seen, really, what happens with it. I mean, I don't give a shit. I use Google anyway. I, my data is just there, so I don't care. Whatever. But if you actually care about uh, privacy and stuff, then, yeah, this must be a bit of a blow. Yeah, I've, so far I've found Metager, which is 
some sort of meta search engine based in Germany. So uh, whatever the German equivalent of the FBI slash NSA is there now seeing all my search results. So good on them. A quick point on your, or Joe, your mention of Google there. I saw an article somewhere recently, in the last couple of days, in fact, that said, uh, go to this link, this uh, Google link, and it will show you what Google tells advertisers about you, and then you can go in there and tweak it and, and correct mistakes and things like that. Um, I use Google for searching all the time, and the it had only two pieces of information about me, my age and my gender, and that was it, apparently. So I, don't, I can't find the link, but we'll dig it out and stick it in the show notes. Um, it would be interesting to see what Google knows about you guys, if, if it's more than just age and gender. Mine would be age, gender, obsessed with guitars and Linux. Keen on Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Loves Boris Johnson. Can't get enough of him. <laughs> really admires Cummings as a strategist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I found a link, but it's in the Daily Mail. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> that says everything Brexit. we need to know. Yeah. Okay, well, fuck that. We're not putting that in the notes. Let's move on then. Let's talk about GitLab. And they had planned to introduce some telemetry, which was proprietary JavaScript. Um, then there was something of a backlash, shall we say, and now they've changed their minds. Yeah, well, I have a problem with the word telemetry as well, because it makes me think of cool kind of probes going to Mars and Jupiter and things <laughs> and sending back awesome bits of information about space when it's really just cookies spying on you. <laughs> But yeah, I think we've all got GitLab accounts because, you know, prior to GitHub um, allowing you to have private accounts with the free access, um, GitLab was a great option. Um, and I got the same email as well. It's really shocking. Um, but also indicative of how much they've grown um, in financing and funding and influence um, with all the changes going on at uh, GitHub. Because I know that we're going to take this where the story is going to go and, and they've since had to backtrack on on the telemetry data they've been threatening to introduce. And why send this out as a an email that says, you know, and then kind of backtrack on it, we're testing this idea. It's, it's very political. Well, they introduced the idea in the sort of standard tried and tested mechanism, which is we're doing this so that we can learn what you're doing and that we can tailor and improve the product. And personally, I think that I, that is a noble goal. They should be allowed to somehow safely understand how people use their product such that they can focus their efforts on the things that matter to people. So I think that the end goal here is is a good one. Um but obviously, the the way that they went about it is always going to get people's um, backs up. And you know, what a surprise! Everybody got very upset about this, and then they they backed down. Um, so I think that this was more of a PR disaster than it was um, a, a business misstep. I can absolutely understand that 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 they want to under they want to have this information. They want to gather it and do something with it. Um, and we've seen time and time again, people try and find a way to monetize their product, to improve um, what they're doing, and people are up in arms about it. You know, this free thing that I've got from you um, is suddenly going to start asking me questions about how I'm using it and that that's unacceptable, um, which links back to the question we had, well, weeks and weeks ago about how do you monetize these um, these open source and these free products? I on genuinely can understand it with something like Ubuntu, where those those kind of installations go off into the wild and you really don't know. You can kind of track the package downloads and maybe syncs against the time server. But I mean, GitLab must be inundated with data and usage information about how people use their service without necessarily taking it any further. What information are they missing? Well, that's that's a very good question because... In the press releases and the emails that I read, it wasn't apparent exactly what it was that they were going to be tracking, other than the fact that they said they were going to be tracking the the free version, the online, you know, SaaS version that everybody uses, as well as some of the um, do-it-yourself options as well. But it wasn't clear what they were trying to gather, or indeed what they were going to do with that data and how they were going to uh, improve it. I think if they have had to have explained that more clearly up front perhaps it would have ended better yeah and the other thing i would have a problem with is the fact that it was a third party telemetry service uh pendo i think it was called um and you know you don't know what they're really doing with it either you know how tight is the contractual uh, obligations on them as well 
they were in this position, weren't they? Get like, this really fucking strong position when Microsoft came and bought GitHub and loads of people transitioned over. But then since then, from from what I understand, talking to devs, GitHub has just continued to improve and get better and better. And it seems like GitLab has not really capitalized on it. And then they do shit like this that just totally just ruins any goodwill that they may have built up. And it, it just seems like a bit of a misstep by them. But Will, you found that link now, and I've looked at it, and uh, it's pretty fucking spot on for me, because it's got my age right, uh, it says that I'm male, computer and video games, not quite sure on that, uh, computer hardware, definitely, home improvement, yeah, okay, job industry, technology industry, music and audio, pets, TV and video, uh, it, <laughs> parental status, not a parent, yes, yeah, spot on, uh, although it thinks I'm single, so fuck you, Google. <laughs> maybe it knows something you don't. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Better message my missus now. She, she on Google as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. I'm going to get her to have a look and see if it thinks she's married or not. But um, yeah, that's pretty scary shit. Anyway, maybe I should probably not have ad personalization on. Hilariously, apparently Liam doesn't exist for me because I am not a parent according to it but then again God knows when this thing was last used so yeah maybe it was before he was born yeah, yeah. okay this episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean go to do.co slash lnl and you can get $50 credit with 30 days to use it DigitalOcean offers VMs or droplets as they call them in data centers all over the world with really fast network and really fast SSDs and you can choose from one of the distros that they offer, like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, and CentOS, or FreeBSD, or you can use your own custom image. And you can take those distros and build them up exactly how you want. Remember, you've got complete root access to these. Or you can go for one of their one-click apps, like LAMP and LEMP stacks, and WordPress, Discourse, GitLab. And these droplets start from as little as $5 a month, and they scale all the way up to huge amounts of RAM and huge numbers of CPU cores, so you can deploy exactly how much you need for the application that you're using. If you need more storage, they've got block storage and object storage, which is really easy to attach to your droplet and just get going straight away. They have cloud firewalls, so you can block network traffic before it even gets to your VM, amazing backups, and a great Teams feature that allows multiple people to work on one droplet without having to share passwords. So go to do.co slash LNL, get your $50 credit, get started that's do.co slash lnl all right so gnome have decided to fight back against the patent troll um i think we talked about this um i certainly talked about it on various shows it's just a classic patent troll shakedown for in this case shotwell and so they need a bunch of money to try and fight it because they they could just roll over and pay them but then this patent troll will just go after other open source uh, projects so even if you don't use gnome failing <clears throat> you should support them in this fight correct totally uh patent trolls are scum of the earth quite literally i know and if you look at the term i, I mean i i checked whether we discussed it before as well because i thought we had and i don't think we had but it's been covered so much elsewhere and of course yeah. this kind of thing keeps coming up and um, but if you look at the it's the it's so frustrating the terms of the patent is so vague you know not only is it applying to software anyway but it doesn't apply to anything specifically it could be almost anything um and yeah absolutely worth just shouting out and saying look support the gnome foundation in choosing what might be the difficult option oh definitely it's definitely the difficult option just paying them off would be the easy option but um actually fighting it in court is going to cost them way more be a lot of hassle for them and they might not even win you know but they have to try and they're sort of fighting on behalf of all of us really so good on them yeah yeah it is important so, uh, yeah, we'll have a link. Go and donate to them and help them out with that. So Firefox 70 has been released, and it continues this march of anti-tracking and privacy. Yes. I haven't tried it, um, but it says it's got a secure password generation generation with Lockwise and the new Firefox Privacy Protection Report. Um, I'm guilty of giving Mozilla a hard time, and, and um, with Will um, and Canonical and Ubuntu in general, it's like I often forget to thank the people that are doing really great work. And so Firefox 70, I like this direction. I like their security and I like the way that privacy is becoming their kind of 
main selling point. I like this lockwise feature, formerly Firefox Lockbox. They must have got into trouble for that or something. But anyway, there's a feature where if you go and have a look at your saved logins, it shows you which of them may have been compromised in leaks. And so which ones, therefore, you ought to change, which is a really fucking handy feature. That is a great idea. I, the thing is, I've always been reluctant to save my password. I mean, the Firefox Sync, for a while, you could kind of build your own version and run it um, on your own server, which I did, and then that broke at some point. And then I've kind of dropped it because I use Pass, and I've always been reluctant to get back into it. But I really should, because there's no reason why not, because, you you know, everything's encrypted with your own key. It's not, you know, stored and encrypted. But Well, Phelan, you're all over this, aren't you? This is the one cloud service that you use. Yeah, uh, mainly out of laziness, to be quite honest, because I did want to set up Pass just like Graham had, but I have the plugin not fully installed, and I've not really set up the GPG keys for it either, really, to be strictly honest. So, yeah, it was kind of handy. It synced to laptop on my PC, and um, yeah, it's it's, it's really good because, I mean, I hate websites that tell you, oh, you're not allowed to fucking copy and paste and all this type of shit. And it, it's still pre- prevalent, which is ridiculous because the safest password is going to be the one that's in a, a proper password store, not the crappy one that you make up because you, you need to fucking remember it each time. Um, So, yeah, Lockwise looks an awful lot better than the old sort of saved user data that was in there before. So it, it brings a bit more credibility to the fact that it's not going to disappear at some point in the future, which does fill me with fear at some point where any of this data gets corrupted, which is one of the main reasons why I've not used a third-party service because I'm always a bit dubious as to whether the plugin's going to break at any point, in which case you'd be royally screwed. Like It does feel to me like Mozilla are starting to compete with Chrome exactly where they ought to be. And that is on issues of privacy and tracking and everything. That that seems to me the only possible way that they can take on the behemoth that is Google and Chrome. But yeah, and we've seen Google say that this sort of privacy is very difficult for them to implement. Um, you know, obviously it isn't, but they've chosen to say that it is. And Firefox can demonstrate, Mozilla can demonstrate that it's possible. And so people stop believing the, the hype. Um, it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this is the best and only way that they can compete. Yeah, and obviously on speed and general features and everything, which I think they have done now. I don't really use Chrome enough to know. I only have it installed you know, for the little few things that I need it. But I've heard, at least anecdotally, people have gone back to Firefox because with the, the whole quantum thing and everything, it has got faster and it is competitive with Chrome technically now. And so this frontier is where they've got to go. And so it's, it's good to see them doing it. It's also good that it seems like security and privacy have got in, are, are getting out there as such vital parts of using the web, um, so much so that they can sell a browser, you know, maybe in the same way that um, bad politics sells the idea that people get more involved in politics, you know, with, with security and privacy becoming an issue. Yeah, and if you look at the one of the reports that they've built in now is this um, privacy protection or uh, tracking protection report, I think is a really great way of communicating with people just quite how invasive websites are, quite how much tracking is out there on the web uh, and presenting it in a meaningful way to people uh, so that they can understand and, and see the benefit that they're getting from using Firefox over other browsers. All right, well, let's do a quick KDE corner then. Uh, the first one is that the Academy videos are out. The videos are great. There's a there's a fair few ones out there that are quite good. Um, <laughs> there's a funny one on Mycroft for the automobile. I think they call it Autodash. And it is actually surprisingly good. And the, clearly Mycroft has got an awful lot better than Popey's robotic voice telling us about beans because uh, <laughs> he does some demos on that where he's like looking up a couple of directions and locking car doors and all sorts of stuff. It's not actually controlling a car, but it's, you know, just has to tie into a car API. And uh, there's another cool one about the the drone software that we talked about before um, for the base station for drone control. But there's a load of them there. Um, really good. Worth, worth a look. Another thing that's actually been going along is um, the Plasma Mobile has uh, getting a lot of work. There's a great blog to follow if anybody's interested in this. And the um, 
post-market OS has now got Plasma Mobile uh, images available or installable. I'm not entirely sure. I don't have a phone that could do it. Uh, but they've been doing loads of work on that. And there's a couple of blog posts there for the last four or five weeks of work that they've been doing. It's starting to look pretty professional looking as well. So Yeah, I think the Pine phone's really pushing that forward. Yeah, I I really want to get one of those, to be quite honest, because, um, you know, with a few extra apps written out or even maybe trying a few myself where you're doing QML based apps and tying in with Kiragami and stuff, you know, proper frameworks that aren't kind of controlled by anybody else. It, it looks really promising. Yeah. Next we'll have K album running on that. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to get it working in a snap. You bring it up so much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and yes, K itinerary is still looking for more extractors. So if you've got any examples of travel tickets, things like that, you get through your email from various travel companies, uh, you should get in touch with the guys if you can and send them in because they've been working on some of the custom extractors for various different things like uh, Deutsche Bahn and all the SNCF and things like that. And uh, yeah, they can always use them. So uh, there was a bit of a call for that as well. And this thing works because... Um, I contributed to Aer Lingus, the Irish national carrier for for uh, flights. And uh, when my emails come in, I get a nice little box. I can just click add to calendar and things like that. So it ties it in nicely, especially with the phone coming along. It's going to tie in really well. So Yeah, instead of creepy Google doing it, you can use open source software. And the last one for the uh, KD sufferers out there, the cashew will be no more very soon. Uh, come Plasma 518. Uh, they're getting rid of the menu that you essentially used to use to control like the plasma widgets on the screen and the toolbars and all that type of stuff. And it used to have this weird icon, which is, I think, was it yellow and black? At, at the moment now, mine looks like a burger. I don't think it was ever meant to be a cashew, was it? I've forgotten what it was supposed to be. but oh, I have no idea. It looked like, like a broken cashew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is going the way to uh, a context menu, which seems way more logical in all fairness. Yeah. Can I um, jump in this KD corner to say um, I had a fantastic like find of the fortnight in KD Ooh. today. <laughs> I was, um, yeah. or is it a discovery? That's the question. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to copy a table out of a PDF, and I couldn't find anything to do it. You know, um, I don't know. Maybe there's an option, but I tried Google Docs. I tried lots of different things. I tried copy and pasting the text into like a. I thought it'd be formatted as a CSV. Anyway. Ocular, KDE's PDF reader, has an option for copying tables. And what you do is you basically drag some lines for columns and for rows onto the table and then click copy. And it copies it as a table you can paste into something else. That is awesome. Really good. And it, it saved me, you know, well, ages messing around with Vim to try and remember how to get the proper separation between the text. The fact that you were jumping to Vim to save the day there has already proved how wrong that would have been. <laughs> On to a bit of admin then, and thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. It's very much appreciated. Uh, you can join them at latenightlinux.com slash support. And remember, $5 a month on Patreon gets you an advert-free RSS feed. And latenightlinux.com slash contact if you want to get in touch with us. And thank you to everyone who I met at Odd Camp, including whoever it was who got me ill. <laughs> That's really appreciated, you bastard. Um... But uh, I did the panel there, and there's now a recording of that, which is at extras.show slash 26 uh, on Jupiter Extras. So, yeah, have a listen to that. That was pretty cool. But uh, it was Dan Lynch's last old camp that he's going to organize, and also Les Pounder's last one as the chief of the crew. So our camp needs new organizers is the bottom line. So if you are in the UK and want to put on an event with help from people, obviously, then um, do get in touch. Just go to oldcamp.org. There's various ways to get in touch with them there. But the key thing is this. Everybody wants to help, but nobody wants to take charge. And so it's, uh, you know, obviously help is appreciated by anyone who is taking charge, but someone needs to step up or it's not going to happen next year. Um, please do it in the summer if you are going to do it again so I don't get fucking ill again. But, um, yeah, if, if someone doesn't step up, then it's not going to happen. This episode is sponsored by CDN77. Go to cdn77.com. And they are a UK-based CDN provider with an end-to-end -end video processing and delivery platform as their standalone product called Streamflow.
They sponsor a bunch of great open source projects like CentOS, KDE, Fedora, Gentoo, and Funtu. And one of their standout clients is the European Space Agency, who use CDN77 to deliver Hubble images all around the world. They're a real innovation leader. They were the first CDN to implement a lot of new features like HTTP2 and Broccoli compression. And they don't outsource anything. Everything's developed and managed by their own team, including their own DDoS protection. And they can push 80 gigabits per second of live streaming through just one machine through their optimizations. All their servers are running Debian, and the vast majority of them are physical machines with an overall network capacity of more than 14 terabits per second. And they've got 35 points of presence in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with daily peaks regularly exceeding 5 terabits per second. They've got great 24-7 live support and flexible pricing with both great value monthly plans and pay-to-go options. You can get a 14-day free trial with no credit card needed, and if you do stick with them after that, you can get a 40% bonus if you mention Late Night Linux to sales or tech support. So, for example, if you topped up by $1,000, you get $400 on top of that. I hosted the MP3 for an episode of the JRS podcast on CDN77, and it was really easy to set up and link to it, and I had no complaints about the speed from anyone. So go to cdn77.com and start delivering new content. All right, so uh, the elephant in the room is, Will, uh, you're unemployed now. Yay! Uh, <laughs> happily so for a bit until you move on to your next job. So you were the director of uh, Ubuntu Desktop right at Canonical, um, but you've had enough and you've left, and now you're going to work for InfluxDB. So give us the exclusive interview. So <laughs> what was it about that job that made you want to leave? Well, there are yeah many many things. Um, I, I don't think I can put my finger on a, you know a single event having happened that that suddenly you know made me rage quit. But you know it, it's a it's a culmination of of many things over many years. Um, I've been there five years now, so I'm ready for for something new and something different. Um, but I'd say yeah, if I, if I had to put my finger on one one thing that I found most difficult, then I would say it was the travel um, that was the, the real killer for me. So we did four product sprints a year, which were a week each. Then we did two engineering all hands, which were another week each. Then we had two release sprints. Uh, well, the release team had two release sprints. Um, they weren't too bad for me, but it's still, um, you know, still a trip down to London and uh, and working long hours. And then another couple of uh, week-long meetings in various places, for example, going out to see the, um, the OEM team in Taipei for a week and, you know, things like that. A couple of those a, a year. Um, so that's about 10 weeks of travel. And of course, you need to be there on a Monday and um, finish work on Friday afternoon. So that's 20 weekends out of my 52 weekends in a year that were spent um, either in an airport or, you know, having just got home from from being away for a week. Um, that's what's that like nearly 40 percent of my time was spent um Forty percent of my weekends, I should say, were spent away from away from home, and that has, over the last five years, added up to a significant impact on my, um, I don't know, my relationship with my family. I suppose. Presumably, you must have missed key events and stuff. Well, it's, it swings and roundabouts, right? Because I'm at home the rest of the time. So I get to see the kids growing up and going to school, and I get to pick them up from school and things like that. Um, but not having a weekend makes it quite difficult because, you know, we, I don't know, you want to go and see somebody, you want to go and you take the kids out for the weekend. Um, I want to go and, you know, do some sporting activities and those sorts of things. And um, it's, it's very difficult for, for me to fit that into my schedule when half my weekends, give or take, uh, are out the window. So, uh, yeah, it's... I don't know. There's there's lots of sort of social and quality of life uh, things that were missing from my life that I hope uh, I'll be able to put back again. So sporting activities like darts in the pub and <laughs> pool. Yeah, shouting and protesting against Brexit and you know things like that. Well, I mean that seems fair enough. And this new job of yours is not going to involve anywhere near as much travel then. As far as I know, it, it won't do. Um, they do have all hands engineering. It's probably four times a year, but you know, four times a year versus ten times a year is uh, is a significant difference. So yeah, I, I'm expecting to travel less. Yeah, and you're going to be working from home as well then. 
Yeah, still get to work from home. So yeah, all of the benefits of that and uh, and none of the inconveniences of, of having to travel so much. So you don't have to race out and buy a load of trousers. So uh, were there, there must have been other reasons. Uh, do you want to talk about them? or? Well, th- there is another reason which I would like to talk about. But if I do talk about it, I know exactly what the, the reaction is going to be because this is exactly my point. So uh, Ubuntu was in the enviable position of having millions of users on the desktop and... We needed, the desktop team needed to make decisions that were appropriate for all of those users, not, you know, a select few. And so when we did make those sorts of um, bold decisions uh, or, or opinionated decisions about the way that we were going to do something, inevitably there would be the peanut gallery complaining about it loudly and in all the sort of common places. And so as a diligent member of the community you try and educate these people and you try and sort of um, engage with them and and convince them that what you're doing is the right way of doing things and they're just not interested they don't want to hear it Um, and they just complain and so dealing with that sort of thing every day for five years is exhausting and you know by by the end of five years I was tired and, and just worn out from from doing battle with uh, with the Linux community on a day to day basis, it's not all of them, of course. It's not everybody, but yeah, it's that vocal minority who are just dickheads, basically. Well, fifty two percent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, you only have to look at some of the comments in the news stories about this of people saying, "Oh, I'm leaving a sinking ship," and just just fucking just such ridiculous shit like that, and. Uh, and and um, we haven't mentioned who's going to be your replacement. Um, it is a friend of the show, Martin Winpress, who is uh, taking over and to also taking on a few more responsibilities like the um, Windows subsystem for Linux team and stuff. Um, and it's funny that he said he's going to be traveling less as a result of this. So fucking how much? I mean, he, he um, about a month ago, he spent like four out of five weeks away or something. So yeah, I can believe that he will be traveling a little bit less for this <laughs> and he's quite i don't know uh, is he thicker skinned than you maybe is that fair to say yeah I, th- I think so yeah he's got a lot of experience of dealing with community people um w- with his mate hat on he's also got a lot of experience from the podcast and from talking events and that sort of thing so yeah maybe he has got a thicker skin than me um regardless he's just going to do an excellent job of looking after and shepherding Ubuntu desktop. It's, he's the perfect man for the job, and um, he's just going to be amazing. He's going to be really great things are going to come out of that team. Yeah, well, when you said that you were moving on, I said, right, so Winpress is having your job then. Yeah. That was the first thing I said to you, because it just seems like such an obvious fit to me. Yeah, it really is. It's funny that his first release is going to be an LTS 2004, so it's like no pressure or anything. Yeah, I think, well, I I know that we've left the team in good shape for the LTS. The LTS cycle is the one where you take the least risk and do the least new stuff. You know, you need uh, the tried and tested previous two or three cycles uh, work to to be polished and and landed. So in theory, the 2004 cycle shouldn't be too complicated. Um, And we've already done all of that planning. Uh, And Martin and I spent um, a couple of days in London uh, last week, in fact, just going through the plan with a fine tooth comb. So he knows what's going on. He may well bring changes to that plan. Um, But yeah, generally speaking, the LTS should be good to go. Something I, I, I can't really ask you because I know what you're going to say to this, but you've always been very modest and always said that it's the team who have, have put the, you know, the releases together and it's all about the team, team, team. And, uh, you know, you've very much implied it here again that, you know, WinPress taking over, he, he's not like suddenly going to change absolutely everything because it is very much a team effort. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. The, the The planning that we did for 2004 was done, um, well, the first pass at least, was done in Paris, which was, what, I don't know, a month ago or something like that. Um, and we go around the room and everybody in the team has their input and their say on what they think that should be the important things for that cycle. So, yes, it is a, a, a joint effort between all, all the people in the team and everybody has sort of... Um, has, has an opportunity to make their points and have their voice heard. And so briefly then, what's your new gig then? What exactly is InfluxDB apart from being a magical no SQL DB? 
It's a time series database. So this is concerned with when things happened um, as much as anything else. Um, and I will be working on the storage team. So this is getting that information um, in and then writing it to disk as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So it's completely different um, skill set than I, than I currently have. So I'll be learning a whole load of new stuff. Um, but InfluxDB is a is a nice sort of um, coming together of things that I'm also interested in, the things that I've worked on previously in my career, such as network monitoring, computer monitoring, um, IoT, you know, things that I'm, I'm generally have an interest in and, and some experience in. So I'm confident that I understand the the driver behind the business. I, I'm sure I can find some interesting um, angles to, to bring to the job. And uh, I, yeah, I'm excited and looking forward to what the, the next few weeks will bring. Are you going to tell us what you're most excited about with this new job, the new computer you're getting? Ah, uh, well, we'll see, won't we? I, I was, I'm looking forward to it. It's a challenge. I've never owned a Mac before, and this will be my first time having one. Um, well, we'll see, won't we? I'll, I'll gladly report back on my, my sort of first week with a Mac and see just quite how awful it is. Well, it sounds like you will be happier in, you know, a job that is less public facing and, you know, it's less sort of high profile, really. But you are going to continue on with the podcast and uh, maybe you can be a little bit more critical of Gnome going forward, eh? Let's see. <laughs> yeah, because it won't be used anymore. It'll switch to Mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is actually just me in my imagination. There's nothing official in that at all. <laughs> yes, opinions my own. No, I mean, it, it is funny that like people are saying that oh, Ubuntu will switch to Mate now or Ubuntu Mate, you know, you won't have time to do that or whatever. But the reality is that WinPress very much separates what is his hobby which is Ubuntu Mate from his job, which has been various roles at Canonical, including Snapcraft and stuff. And nothing is really going to change. He's going to keep doing Ubuntu Mate as what is essentially a hobby. Um, and he's just changing role, really. So uh, some of the fucking comments that you see, man, people are just so ignorant of mm. what goes into this stuff. Yeah, I agree. And, and and honestly, something I'm sure that you feel from your words, isn't it? You know, Will's done a great job and we should thank him from you know, for all the work he's done on the desktop, the most popular Linux desktop that's done so much to spread the word of open source and Linux, regardless of how you feel about Ubuntu or even GNOME. Yeah, and how you handled that transition to GNOME, Will. I mean, that first release, was it... Uh, 17.10, was it? Or was it 17.10? Oh, yeah, it would have been 17.10, yeah. Yeah. How you handled that, you had such short notice and it was a great release and it just continues to get better. And, you know, you can say it was a team effort and everything, but you were at the helm of it. And so, you know, you did do some good stuff over there. So, yes, well, well done. Thank you. And I'm sure that you'll make InfluxDB get uh, better and better as well. Right, I suppose we'd better get out of here then before my voice completely dies. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later. Mm-hmm.